so I really like betting. Well, that is a virtual all-in, but you may have seen that Justin Bonomo left one chip behind. So even though we've presented him with the red triangle of death graphically, I believe this is a bet of 515,000 because there's a 5K chip still on top of his cards. If you took a look at that board, you saw that Christoph Vogelsang is tanking with a terrible hand. <laughs> you can see that he's beat by Justin Bonomo. Why is he tanking? Honestly, we're going to try to find out. We're not really entirely sure, but this is a very interesting, weird spot because Justin Bonomo starts with very few chips. And normally, this, if we saw this exact action play out in a different tournament with different players, we probably wouldn't think anything of it. However, these are two of the best players in the world. Christoph Vogelsang, one of the very best players in the world. And it's up to us to try and figure out what the heck is going on and why is he not just throwing his hand away right now. And we're going to do our best to siphon the person who suggested this on Twitter. Of course, if you want to suggest a hand for the breakdown, include a YouTube link and a timestamp. Yes. Now, before we get to the hand, we got to thank the people who make this video possible. That's Nitrogen Sports Poker. They are a Bitcoin-only poker site. And at the end of every month, we have a special Poker Guys-only tournament. That does include you, though, not just us. Yeah. <laughs> where it costs less than a dollar to play, and there's a massive overlay every single month. It's free money. you got to get involved. Now, we had our biggest turnout last month, yes. in fact. You have to use the link in the description when you sign up if you want access to that tournament, by the way. Our biggest turnout was 73 players. We need 1,000 players to meet the guarantee. Do a little math, people. Yeah. That means there's a bunch of free money out there. You can be the worst player in the world. It's still plus EV to register. You've got to get in on this. Use the link in the description. Get in there and get you some poker. Let's get to the hand. Very easy open here. Pocket fives for the chip leader. It's such a safe spot because Greenwood shouldn't really be messing around too much here with the Bonomo 12 pick blinds. And then if Justin shoves, then uh, Fogelson can just call. So it's... Really nice situation. <laughs> Top pair for Bonomo. Song has been taking a lot of check check back lines or checking uh, under pairs. Could obviously uh, differ based on uh, bottom of stack and position, but Every single uh, option bottom of takes here is fine. Check raising, check calling, check raising all in. 60,000 apiece. And two pair now for Bonomo. 95% favorite with one card to come. Trick and focal angle slow down here, Lex. Oh, tough to say. It's such a brick that the four is that um, Bonomo might stick around with an eight for another bet. If you think somebody's going to call with middle pair, it's probably best to not bet. Um, but then again, pressure's also really good. So check, check, and a check on the river. Bonomo has 520k behind. There's 395,000 in the middle. I think you can safely assume that Fogelsong is not going to check a king twice. Um, so I really like betting. Well, All that right. is... A virtual all-in, but you may have seen that Justin Bonomo 
left one chip behind. So even though we've presented him with the red triangle of death graphically, I believe this is a bet of 515,000 because there's a 5K chip still on top of his cards. He didn't say anything, did he? No, he didn't. Well, it's a virtual all-in. Let's be honest, he's not going to fold for the initial 5K. And Vogelstein giving this some serious thought. It's really tough to come up with a hand that you beat, though, at this point. You pretty much have to give somebody ace high or turning a three into a bluff. But how many hands, you know, does a short stack defend with a three in it? Uh, wow. See, I'm gonna make a loose call. That's a call. Wow. He said I'm making a loose call, and sure enough, you are beat, Christoph. That is a call. I'm sure it is because I saw it happen, but what why? Why is it a call? Christoph Vogel saying, okay, let's talk a little bit about this guy for a second. He's really good, right? Really, really good. He's considered by many of the elite to be the best GTO player in the world, meaning he knows every spot, he knows his frequencies, he should know exactly what to do in every spot. He looks a little confused in this spot before making ultimately a very bad decision, what is what it looks like. <laughs> it so seems like it. How do we get here? Can we justify this? Is this possibly good? Well, let's try. Okay. Let's, let's see what's going on at least. So. Part of this plays out pre-flop and on the flop, I think, which leads into these decisions a little bit. So Vogelsang would have to believe that Bonomo's going to shove certain hands pre-flop, and he doesn't. Well, right? certainly, because Bonomo's quite short. He's definitely yeah. got a reshoving stack. He's got like 13 blinds or something like that. Right. So we expect any ace or any pair, any good hand, really, Bonomo's probably going to shove pre-flop. King 4 suited maybe near the bottom of his just calling range pre-flop. Yeah, I, that, that's right, actually. We, we had a talk on our podcast about even should Bonomo be shoving this, and we went back and forth about that, which you can hear if you're interested in us getting into all that on the podcast itself. But then on the flop, this is also really important because Bonomo check calls. Right. So he almost never, ever, with his stack size, ever has a flush draw here. Yeah, although we might expect him to check shove a king sometimes. Yeah. However, Vogel saying bet super tiny. That doesn't really matter that much because this pot is still really valuable to Justin Bonomo with his current stack size. But maybe Bonomo is thinking, I need to double up in some way because at this point in the tournament, he is the short stack to such an extent that even after he doubles up through this hand, he's still the short stack. Yeah. So he's thinking, okay, I can play a little higher variance, just check call, hope Vogelsang keeps putting pressure on and doesn't have anything. Of course, Bonomo gets this great turn card and it goes check, check. Yes, yeah, so here we are, we get to the river and Bonomo's sitting there, even though the jack of spades may look like a bad card, it's really not that bad for Justin Bonomo because Vogelsang pretty much never has spades because Vogelsang is gonna just put lots of pressure on the turn on Bono, probably just move him in, honestly, or effectively move him in on the turn if he's got a spade draw. Right. Right. Just about always. So Bono was just not worried about it. By the way, Bono was just going broke if he's beat anyway. Like, of course. Whatever. He's not going to ever give up this hand. Right. Bono also is sitting there thinking, I mean, first of all, my hand's best, right? Unless, unless this guy somehow has two jacks and decides to check back the turn, which I don't even know that he would. He probably wouldn't. Then, like, I'm just good here. The question for Bono was, how do I get paid if this guy doesn't have anything, he's probably even betting a lot of eights on the turn. Yeah, I think he probably is. That's the problem. But Bonomo might think that the bluff is going to give up by this point. By Vogelsang, he only bet 60k on the flop. He might be giving up. He might be thinking, Maybe. okay, Vogelsang has a lot of checkbacks in his range. I want to give him a chance to pay me off at least. Now, these are all stretches because I can't imagine getting paid off with King 4 here with Vogelsang's range being so capped, but somehow it works out. Not when you bet 520 into 395, right? Yeah. Maybe if you bet super small, you could get paid off. But this is really different. This is a polarizing bet. Now, Bonomo does have one of the best hands he can ever show up with here. Maybe the best hand he can it's ever show up at with. At least close to it. Like, he, maybe King 8 is the only other yeah. hand he can have that's better. It's kind of crazy, right? But true, he's not going to have any pocket pairs either. He's not going to have King Jack. He's not going to have any of those things. He's not going to have any sets at all. So then it comes down to, okay, so this is like, how can, how can Bonomo even almost make this bet? It's so hard to get called. But then we've got the secondary and much bigger question of, 
How can Vogelsang call with two fives here? Well, I think for, from Bonomo's perspective, he's just thinking Vogelsang is essentially a black box of GTO, and I'm just going to put money in and hope he gives me money back. <laughs> like that's, that's probably what he's thinking. He's got to call with something yeah. is what Justin's probably I thinking. I guess he's going to call with two red fives? I mean, I don't understand this. Now, oh. there is one... One GTO argument that Vogelsang can make that maybe makes this justifiable, and that is what we talk about a lot, which is distribution, which is where does this hand fall in the quality of hands that we possibly show up with here? And as played with Bonomo's stack, this might be pretty high in, in distribution. It may be the third best hand he can ever show up with. Like, he may have seven, sixes, and fives. Like, Vogelsang may be betting all of his eights on the turn and all better hands than eights on the turn. So he just thinks, like, of all the hands I can show up with here ever that are showdownable, this is one of the very best. However, always in these situations, you do have to balance it against the situation and what's actually played out. On a king, eight, three, two spade board, where Bonomo's always raising spades on the flop with his stack size, which we have to believe he is, now we can only beat a tray that's deciding to turn itself into a bluff. Which would that's never happen. Like, pretty much literally it, and there's no reason for Bonomo to decide to turn his tray into a bluff here. Yeah, it doesn't really make any sense for Bonomo to play a three like this, so the question becomes, what can we beat then that Bonomo plays like this? A bluff? You may be saying, it's a bluff poker, guys. Right. How can it be a bluff? Bonomo has no chips to start this hand. He yeah. can't check call the flop with air with queen high for no reason. He's never going to do that. Maybe he would do that if they both had 100 big blinds. But he's definitely not doing that when he starts the hand with 13 bigs. I mean, what we're down to is saying to yourself as Vogel saying, maybe he can have some weird ace highs that he decides not to shove pre- uh, sure. I know. It's Betting already the river for really some hard. Reason. To, well, I only bet 60000 on the turn, and when I check it back, he's afraid his ace high isn't good enough. So now he's going to, you know, now he's got to shove to get me off a slightly better ace high. I mean, that's all I got. That, that sounds is, like the ramblings of a madman, yeah, honestly. No, I mean, no, that I doesn't make any sense. It's it really, really... None of it makes sense. We ultimately have to think that Vogelsang is making this distribution argument in his own head. The thing is, in our opinion, at least, distribution is an argument you should use for a call or a fold when you're on the fence. This isn't a spot where you should be on the fence. He has right. such a range disadvantage against Bonomo at this point. It's time to give it up. We haven't put many chips in this pot. I really don't get this. Please, lovely viewers, help me find out why this is happening. Yeah, I would even say this. Vogel saying probably has some checkbacks in his turn range, which are stronger than one would expect because he's a GTO player. He probably has a few top pairs or weird stuff Maybe. that's stronger than you would expect. Maybe not because um, because Bonomo's you know freaking stack size is so his small. His freaking stack size, but, man. But otherwise, maybe maybe that's part of it too. But that means that pushes his fives even further down the distribution. But either way, this just seems like it can't really be a call here. Christoph, is it because you only had thirty seconds? So you just didn't have time, so you just made the call. That's all know. we got. All right, this was maybe one of the most perplexing hands we've done, at least in a very very long time. Sometimes we maybe we get it wrong, but usually we we feel strongly about it at yeah. least. Here we're like, how is it possible that this went this way? So we got to hear what your opinions are on this, people. What do you think about this as played? There's a lot of different streets to talk about. Pre-flop, what do you think about Justin deciding to only call? On the flop, what do you think about Justin only calling? But most importantly, what do you think about both players' decisions on the river? Justin betting more than pot in a spot where Vogelsang almost never has a very strong hand. And Vogelsang ultimately calling with that very weak hand. I mean, that's the one we want to know about. Of course, that's the biggest question of all. Please let us know in the comments. We really want to see what you have to say. Is the answer just that Christoph Vogelsang has been running incredibly well for two and a half years and he's actually terrible? I mean, no. that's one possible answer no. right now. He's actually really good, obviously. It's just so crazy. We got to know. We got to know more about what you guys think. Anyway, if you want to see another perplexing decision by an elite player against Justin Bonomo, mm. you got to check out this weird decision by Davide Katai by clicking right up here. That one is almost as weird as this one, but maybe not quite. It's weird. You got Christoph, you got Davide. Everyone's making strange decisions with small pocket pairs against Justin Bonomo. When you're at a final table of a big event, yeah. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why it keeps happening. Uh, it never really ultimately works out for Justin, though. He never, he never finishes higher than he would want to. You know, he always, like in this one we're watching right now, he finishes fifth, and that one he finishes third. It just sucks for Justin. You just can't win, no matter <laughs> how bad the decisions are that are made against him. Anyway, if you want to hear more of our perplexed thought process about this hand, you got to check out our podcast where we go deep into every little aspect of this. We talk about the ICM implications. We talk about how Christoph Vogelsang thinks from a GTO perspective, mm. how Justin Bonomo may interpret Christoph Vogelsang's thoughts. We get really deep into it. Check out the podcast. And if you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel.